We're going to be continuing with chapter 10. This is the fourth part, part D for the muscular system. If you have not viewed the, the previous three, please be sure to look for those in the description below. And in addition to, to that, they are also in the playlist. If you have any questions, please email me. Uh, you can find that my information in the description area below. Send me a message through the, the YouTube or on Facebook, uh, or just leaving a, a comment below. Uh, I would prefer that you email me directly uh, reason being is sometimes I don't end up getting comments for whatever re for whatever reason I'm not able to reply back to you. I've had a few instances where uh, a few of you have asked questions, and uh, for one reason or, the, or another, I was not able to reply back uh, in the comment section. Uh, so if you email me, I'll get it. Most likely, I'll end up getting your email, and then I'll uh, I'll get back to you uh, quite uh, much more uh, quickly than uh, probably through YouTube. Okay, so let's move forward. So we're going to be looking at the muscles that are crossing the shoulder joint and these are responsible for the movements of your arm. Remember that's the, the humerus bone. So again going back to the shoulder joint if you guys remember uh, that the shoulder joint it's a ball and socket joint and this is the most flexible joint that we have in our body. But because it's the most flexible joint uh, it's not very stable so it's a highly unstable joint. Several muscles that cross each shoulder joint to insert onto the humerus. All the muscles that are acting on the humerus they originate from the pectoral girdle. However, we have two of these muscles, the latimus dorsi and the pectoralis major, which originate on the axial skeleton. So of the nine muscles that cross the shoulder joint, only the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi, and the deltoid muscles are the prime movers of our movement. The remaining muscles are synergies and fixators. Now four of these muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis, they make up the rotator cuff muscles. They originate on the scapula and their tendons, they blend in with the fibrous capsule of the shoulder joint on their way to the humerus. While the rotator cuff muscles act as synergists in the angular and rotational movements of the arm, their main function is to reinforce the capsule of the shoulder joint to prevent dislocation of the humerus. The other two muscles, the teres major and the coracobrachialis, while they cross the shoulder joint, they don't contribute to its reinforcement. Generally speaking, muscles that originate anterior to the shoulder joint, so we're talking about the pectoralis major, the coracobrachialis, and the anterior fibers of the deltoid, they flex the arm. So like when you're lifting something anteriorly, these are the muscles that play. Now the prime mover of arm flexion is the pectoralis major. The biceps brachii of the arm, it also assists in this action. Muscles originating posterior to the shoulder joint, they extend the arm. These include your latissimus dorsi, the posterior fibers of the deltoid muscles, and the teres major. The latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis muscles are antagonists of one another in the flexion and sanction movements of the arm. The middle region of the deltoid muscle which extends over the supralateral side of the humerus is a prime mover of arm abduction. The main arm abductors are the pectoralis major anteriorly and the latissimus dorsi posteriorly. So here we have an illustration that's showing you the, uh, the shoulder joint. And uh, this first muscle that we're going to be looking at is this pectoralis major. So this is a large fan-shaped muscle that's covering the superior portion of the chest. It forms the anterior axillary fold and it's divided into a clavicular and uh, sternal parts. The origin is going to be the sternal end of the clavicle, the sternum, the cartilages of ribs 1 through 6 and sometimes 7, and the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscles. As for the insertion, the fibers that converge to insert by a short tendon into the intratubercular sulcus and the greater tubercle of the humerus. As for the actions, this is a prime mover of arm flexion. It rotates the arms medially and it also adducts the arms against resistance. Now with the scapula and the arms in a fixed position, it pulls the rib cage upwards. So this helps you in, in climbing and throwing and pushing and enforce inspiration. Now this thick multipanite muscle that forms the rounded shoulder mass is the deltoid. And this is a site that's commonly used for uh, administering uh, intramuscular injections, specifically in men, because we have this, men typically have a larger, more prominent deltoid than in females. Um, the other place that you give injections is your, uh, the, the gluteus maximus, uh, that's your, your butt muscle. Its insertion is a deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. And as for the origin, it embraces the insertion of the trapezius, the lateral third of the clavicle, in addition to the chromium and spine of the scapula. It's innervated by the axillary nerve. And as for its actions, when all the fibers contract simultaneously, it acts as the prime mover of arm abduction. It's an antagonist of the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi, which adduct the arm. 
Now, if only the anterior fibers are active, it can actually act as a powerful muscle inflection and medial rotation of the humerus. So, because of that, it's said to be uh, a synergist of the pectoralis major as well. Now, if only the posterior fibers are active, it causes extension and lateral rotation of the arm. This muscle is also active when we're walking and our arms are swinging. Now we're going to be looking at this broad, flat, triangular muscle of our lower back, which we find around our lumbar region. This is the latissimus dorsi. Uh, it's covered by the trapezius superior laterally, and it contributes to the posterior wall of the axilla. Its insertion is going to be the intertubercular groove of the humerus. And as for the origin, uh, there's going to be several sites. So we have the spinous process of T7 all the way down to extending down to L5 of the vertebrae, the iliac crest of the sacrum, the thoracolumbar fascia, the inferior angle of the scapula, and the lower three or four ribs. It's innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve, so specifically we're looking at cervical nerve 6, cervical nerve 7, and cervical nerve 8. The subscapularis is a rotator cuff muscle. It forms part of the posterior wall of the axilla, and its tendon of insertion passes in front of the shoulder joint. Its insertion is a lesser tubercle of the humerus, and as for the origin, it's a subscapular fossa of the scapula. It's innervated by the subscapular nerve, so we're looking at cervical nerves 5, cervical nerve 6, and cervical nerve 7. As far as for its actions go, it's a chief medial rotator of the arm. It's assisted by the pectoralis major, and it helps hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity, stabilizing the shoulder joint. The supraspinatus muscle, which is a rotator cuff muscle, which runs deep to the trapezius, is named for its location on the posterior aspect of the scapula. Its origin is the supraspinous fossa of the scapula, and as for the insertion, it's the superior part of the greater tubercle of the humerus. It's innervated by the suprascapular nerve, and its prime action is to initiate abduction of the arms. Uh, it also helps stabilize the shoulder joint, and it helps prevent downward dislocation of the humerus. So when you're carrying something heavy, like a gallon of milk or a suitcase, this is one of the muscles that's helped preventing your arm from being dislocated. As you can see, the deltoid has been cut out, and because it's been cut out, we can see this one next muscle here, the infraspinatus. So it's partially covered by the deltoid and the trapezius as well. Uh, it's named for its scapular location, and it's also another one of the rotator cuff muscles. Its origin is going to be the infraspinous fossa of the scapula, and the insertion is going to be the greater tubercle of the humerus posterior to the insertion of the supraspinatus. Like the supraspinatus, it's also innervated by the suprascapular nerve. As for its actions, the primary action is to rotate the arms laterally, and it also helps hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity, again, to further stabilize the shoulder joint. The next rotator cuff muscle we're going to be looking at is the teres minor muscle. And this is a small elongated muscle. It lies inferior to the infraspinatus and sometimes it may be inseparable. Its origin is the lateral border of the dorsal scapular surface and for the insertion it's a greater tubercle of the humerus inferior to the inf infraspinatus insertion. As far as its actions go, they're going to be the same as the infraspinatus muscles. We're talking about rotating the arm laterally and it's innervated by the axillary nerve. Next, we move on to the teres major, and this is a thick, rounded muscle. It's located inferior to the teres minor, and it helps form the posterior wall of the axilla, along with the latissimus dorsi and the subscapularis. Its origin is the posterior surface of the scapula at the inferior angle, and its insertion is the crust of the lesser tubercle on the anterior humerus. Its insertion tendon, it gets fused with that of the latissimus dorsi. Its prime actions include extending, medially rotating, and adducting the arm. It's also a synergist of the latissimus dorsi. It's innervated by the lower subscapular nerves, so we're looking at cervical nerve 6 and cervical nerve 7. Finally, we come to the coracobrachialis, and this is a small cylindrical muscle. Its origin is a coracoid process of the scapula, and it inserts into the medial surface of the humerus shaft. Uh, its action is to flex and adduct the arms, and it's a synergist of the pectoralis major. And it's innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. There's also several animations for these muscles that we discussed, so be sure you view them all. There's one for the pectoralis major muscle over here. Another one here for the deltoid muscle. Another one over here for that shows you the latissimus dorsi. Then we have one here for the subscapularis. The supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Again, you can find these on the, the, the Pearson website uh, or with the DVD that may have come with your book. In addition to that, be sure you can always uh, look for it on YouTube. There's another one for the teres minor, one for the teres major. There are several more uh, videos for the muscles that act on the shoulder joint and the humerus. So this is an overview, another overview video.
And again, this one shows the muscles that cross the glenohumeral joint. This one shows movements that form at the rotator cuff. And there's another one that shows movements uh, at the rotator cuff. Again, there's another one for the glenohumeral joint. Uh, there's another one. And again, yet another one. And here's one more. And I think this is the last one for the glenohumeral joint. So please be sure you view all of these. Uh, again, you, know, you can find them at the Pearson website uh, or the, the DVD that came with your book. In addition to that, you can search for it on uh, YouTube. Now we're going to be looking at muscles that are crossing the elbow joint for flexion and extension of the forearm. So muscles that are spanning out across the upper arm and uh, going to the elbow joint, they insert on the forearm bones. Now since the elbow is a hinge joint, movements promoted by these arm muscles, they're limited almost entirely to flexion and extension of the forearm. Walls of the fascia, they divide the arm into two muscle compartments. We have the posterior extensors and the anterior flexors. The main forearm extensor is the triceps brachii muscle, which forms nearly the entire musculature of the posterior compartment. All the anterior arm muscles, they flex the forearm at the elbow joint. And these are the brachialis, the biceps brachii, and the brachioradialis muscles. Now the brachialis and the biceps, they insert into the ulna and the radius respectively, and they contract simultaneously during flexion. And these are the chief forearm flexors. Just about everybody is familiar with the biceps brachii muscle because when we flex our forearm, this is the muscle that bulges out. Now the one that's not as well known is the brachialis. Now this lies deep to the biceps, but it's as equally as important during the flexion. So it's a synergist of the biceps brachii. The brachioradialis also helps flex the arm, but it's a weak forearm flexor. Now the only muscle that we find on the posterior compartment of the arm is this large fleshy triceps brachii muscle. It has three headed origin, a lo the long and the lateral heads, they lie superficial to the medial head. So for the origin of the long head, it's the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The lateral head, we find the insertion on the posterior shaft of the humerus. And for the medial head, it's the posterior humeral shaft distal to the radial groove. As for the insertion, it's by the common tendon that goes into the lurknon process of the ulna. Its prime action is a powerful forearm extensor, and it's an antagonist of the forearm flexors. The long and lateral heads, they're mainly active in extension against resistance, and it's innervated by the radial nerve. The anconius, which is a short triangular muscle, is partially blended with the distal end of the triceps on the posterior aspect of the humerus. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the lateral aspect of the olecranon process of the ulna. Its primary action is to control ulnar abduction during forearm pronation, and it's also a synergist of the triceps brachii during elbow extensions. And as far as this uh, nerve supply goes, it's innervated by the radial nerve. So these are the two posterior muscles of the elbow joint. So be sure to watch this video over here uh, for the triceps brachii muscle. Again, go to the Pearson website or the, um, the DVD that came with your book in addition to searching on YouTube. And now we're going to be looking at the anterior muscles of the elbow joint. So we start off with this biceps brachii muscle. It's a two-headed fusiform muscle. The bellies, they, they unite as the insertion point is approached. At the tendon of the long head, it also helps to stabilize the shoulder joint. The origin for the short head is the coracoid process, and for the long head is the supraglenoid tubercle and the lip of the glenoid cavity. The tendon of the long head, it runs within the capsule and into the intratubercular sulcus of the humerus. The insertion is by a common tendon into the radial tuberosity. Its prime action is to flex the elbow joint and supinate the forearms. These actions, they usually occur at the same time. So when you're taking a bottle of uh, olive oil and you're pulling the cork out, so as you pull the cork out, you know, think about when you're turning the cork and then pulling back up and flexing the arm. Uh, this is the action that's, that's happening and provided by this biceps brachii muscle. And it's innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. The brachialis muscle is a strong muscle that's immediately deep to the biceps brachii on the distal humerus. Its origin is the front of the distal humerus, and it embraces the insertion of the deltoid muscle. For the insertion, it's the coronoid process of the ulna and the capsule of the elbow joint. Like the biceps brachii, it's also innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. And for its action, it's a major forearm flexor. Uh, it lifts the ulna as the biceps lifts the radius. Now we look at the brachioradialis muscle. This is a superficial muscle of the lateral forearm. It forms the lateral boundary of the cuboidal fossa, and it extends from the distal humerus to the distal forearm. 
Its origin is the lateral supracondylar ridge at the distal end of the humerus, and the insertion is the base of the styloid process of the radius. It's a synergist in forearm flexion, and it works best when the forearm is partially flexed and semi-pronated. It also stabilizes the elbow during rapid flexion and extension. It's innervated by the radial nerve, and this is an exception as the radial nerve typically serves extensor muscles. So be sure to watch this animation on the biceps brachii. Here's another one for the brachialis, and another for the brachioradialis. And there's an, uh, this is an overview of the elbow joint in the forearm. And this one's for the muscles of the elbow joint. And looks like one more for muscles of the elbow joint. And we have an yet another for the elbow joint. So please be sure to view, view all of these animations. Uh, you can expect questions from, from on the exam uh, from these animations. It's highly likely. So please be sure to, uh, to look out for these. Uh, again, go to the website for Pearson. Uh, you can look for it on YouTube. In addition to that, uh, if your book came with the DVD, look, on, uh, look for it on that. Now we're going to be moving on to the muscles of the forearm, and these are responsible for movements of your wrist, your hands, and fingers. The muscles of the forearm perform several basic functions. Some cause wrist movements, others move the fingers and thumbs, and a few help pronate and supinate the forearm. In most cases, their fleshy portions, they contribute to the roundness of the proximal forearm, and then they taper to long tendons distally to insert into the hand. At the wrist, these tendons, they're securely anchored by a band-like thickening of deep fascia that's called the flexor and extensor retiniculi. These bands at the wrist, they keep the tendons from jumping outwards when tensed. Crowded together in the wrist and palm, the muscle tendons are surrounded by slippery tendon sheets that minimize friction as they slide against one another. The forearm muscles are subdivided by fascia into two main compartments, the anterior flexors and the posterior extensors, each with superficial and deep muscle layers. So the uh, anterior muscles, their flexors, they insert via the flex flexor retiniculum, and the posterior muscles, which are the extensors, they insert via the extensor retiniculum. Most flexors in the anterior compartment arise from a common tendon on the humerus and are innervated largely by the median nerve. The two anterior compartment muscles are not flexors but pronators, the pronator teres and the pronator quadratus, and pronation is one of the most important forearm movements. Muscles of the posterior compartment, they extend the wrist and fingers. One exception is the supinator muscle, which assists the biceps brachii muscle of the arm in supinating the forearm. Of the eight muscles of the anterior compartment, five of them are superficial and three of them are deep. Most of them, they arise from a common flexor tendon and they're attached to the medial epicondyle of the humerus and they have additional origins as well. Most of the tendons of insertion of these flexors, they're held in place at the wrist by a thickening of deep fascia called the flexor retiniculum. First, we're going to be looking at the pronator teres muscle. This is a two-headed muscle, and when we're looking at it in a superficial view, you can find it between the proximal margins of the brachioradialis and the flexor carpi radialis. It forms the medial boundary of the cuboidal fossa. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the coronoid process of the ulna. Its insertion is by a common tendon, mid-shaft on the lateral aspect of the radius. Its prime action is to pronate the forearm, and it's also a weak flexor of the elbow. It's innervated by the median nerve. Next, we look at the flexor carpi radialis muscle, and this runs diagonally across the forearm. Midway, its fleshy belly is replaced by a flat tendon that becomes cord-like at the wrist. So you can see that over here. Uh, its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the base of the second and third metacarpals. The insertion tendon is easily seen and it provides as a guide to the position of the radial artery. And this is useful when taking a pulse and also in obtaining uh, blood gases, uh, when you're taking what's called an arterial blood gas. Uh, this is one of the landmarks that you use. You want to go lateral to, this, uh, to that tendon when you feel it. Its prime action is that it's a powerful flexor of the wrist and it abducts the hand. And it's also a weak synergist of elbow flexion. It's also innervated by the median nerve. The palmaris longus, which is the small fleshy muscle with a long insertion tendon, it may be used as a guide to find the median nerve that lies lateral to it at the wrist. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and the insertion is the palmar aponeurosis. Uh, it's also innervated by the median nerve. Its prime action is to tense the skin and fascia of the palm during hand movements. It's also a weak wrist flexor, in addition to being a weak synergist for elbow flexion. And it's also innervated by the median nerve. Next, we're going to be looking at this flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. It's a two-headed muscle, and it's the most medial muscle of the group. Uh, the ulnar nerve also lies lateral to its tendon. 
The origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the olecranon process and posterior surface of the ulna. The insertion is going to be the pisiform and the hamate bones and base of the fifth metacarpal. The prime action for this muscle is that it's a powerful flexor of the wrist and it also adducts the hand in concert with the extensor carpi ulnaris. In addition to that, it also stabilizes the wrist during finger extensions. And it's innervated by the ulnar nerve. And finally, we have the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. It's a two-headed muscle that's more deeply placed, and it's overlain by muscles above, but it's still visible at the distal end of the forearm. As for its origin, it's the medial epicondyle of the humerus, the coronoid process of the ulna, and the shaft of the radius. Its insertion is by four tendons into the middle phalanges of fingers 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's innervated by the median nerve, and its prime action is that it flexes the wrist and middle phalanges of fingers 2, 3, 4, and 5. And this is an important finger flexor when speed and flexion against resistance are required. Now we're going to be looking at the deep muscles of the forearm. And the first one we're going to be looking at is the flexor pollicis longus. And it's partially covered by the flexor digitorum superficialis. And it parallels the flexor digitorum profundus laterally. Its origin is the anterior surface of the radius and the intraosseous membrane. And the insertion is the distal phalanx of the thumb. And its prime action is to flex the distal phalanx of the thumb. And it's innervated by a branch of the median nerve. So we're looking at cervical nerve 8 and the first thoracic nerve. Now we're going to be looking at the flexor digitorum profundus. And this muscle has extensive origins. It's overlain entirely by the flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, the origins it has include the coronite process, the anteromedial surface of the ulna, and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is by four tendons into the distal phalanges of fingers 2, 3, 4, and 5. Its prime action is that it flexes the distal interphalangeal joints. It's also a slow-acting flexor of any or all the fingers, and it assists in flexing the wrist. As to its nerve supply, the medial half is innervated by the ulnar nerve, and the lateral half is innervated by the median nerve. And lastly, we're at the pronator quadratus. This is the deepest muscle of the distal forearm. It passes downward and laterally, and this is the only muscle that arises solely from the ulna and it inserts solely into the radius. Its origin is the distal portion of the anterior ulnar shaft, and its insertion is the distal surface of the anterior radius. It's innervated by the median nerve, and its action is that it's the prime mover of forearm pronation. It also acts with the pronator teres, and it helps to hold the ulna and radius together. So be sure you view this muscle, uh, this video on the pronator teres, and this one on the flexor carpi radialis. We have another video here for the flexor, uh, the flexor carpi ulnaris, and another one for the flexor digitorum superficialis. And this is for the anterior muscles of the wrist and fingers, and this is a continuation of that. So please be sure you watch these videos. Uh, look for them on YouTube, or you can. Best thing to do is to go to the, the Pearson website, and you'll have access to all this. Or if your book came with the DVD, be sure to look at that. Now we're going to be looking at the posterior compartment muscles. They consist of four superficial and four deep muscles. They're all innervated by the radial nerve or its branches, and more than half of the posterior compartment muscles they arise from a common extensor origin tendon that's attached to the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the adjacent fascia. The extensor tendons are held in place at the posterior aspect of the wrist by the extensor retinaculum, which prevents the bolstering of these tendons when the wrist is hyperextended. The extensor muscles of the fingers end in a broad hood over the dorsal side of the digits called the extensor expansion. So there's about five animations that go over the muscles that we're going to be looking at, so be sure you look at that. Uh, so this is the first one, this shows you the posterior muscles of the wrists and fingers. Uh, this other one, this is a continuation of part B. Um, this one goes over the extensor carpi radialis longus. This goes over the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And this one goes over the extensor digitorum. And we have the extensor carpi ulnaris over here. So be sure that you view all these animations either on the Pearson website, the DVD that may have come with your book, or you can always look for it on uh, YouTube. So the first superficial muscle that we're going to be looking at is the extensor carpi radialis longus. And this parallels with the brachial radialis on the lateral forearm, and it may blend with it. Its origin is a lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, and its insertion is the base of the second metacarpal. Now, its prime actions are to extend and abduct the wrist. It extends the wrist in conjunction with the extensor carpi ulnaris, and it abducts the wrist in conjunction with the flexor carpi radialis. 
and is innervated by the radial nerve. The extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle lies deep to the extensor carpi radialis longus and is somewhat shorter than it. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and its insertion is the base of the third metacarpal. It's innervated by the deep branch of the radial nerve and its prime action is to extend and abduct the wrist. Uh, it also acts as a synergist with the extensor carpi radialis longus to steady the wrist during finger flexion. The extensor digitorum lies medial to the extensor carpi radialis brevis. A detached portion of it, called the extensor digiti minimi, it extends to the little finger, as you can see going right down here. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is by four tendons into the extensor expansion and the distal phalanges of fingers 2, 3, 4, and 5. Its action is that it's the prime mover of the finger extension, and it also extends the wrist and can abduct the fingers, so it's when you're flaring your fingers and is innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. This long slender muscle is extensor carpi ulnaris. It's the most medial of the superficial posterior muscles. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the posterior border of the ulna. Its insertion is the base of the fifth metacarpal. Its action is to extend the wrist in conjunction with the extensor carpi radialis and it adducts the wrist in conjunction with the flexor carpi ulnaris. And it's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. And there's more uh, animations for you guys to look at, so please be sure to look at this. This one's the posterior muscles of the wrist and fingers. This is a part A. This one's part B. This shows the extensor carpi radialis longus. This one goes over the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And this one goes over the extensor digitorum. And this goes over the extensor carpi ulnaris. So be sure you view these videos either at the Pearson website, on YouTube, or in the CD or the DVD that may have come with your book. Now we're going to be looking at the deep muscles. So the first one we're going to look at is the supinator. And this is a deep muscle at the posterior aspect of the elbow, and it's largely concealed by the superficial muscles. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the proximal ulna. Its insertion is going to be the proximal end of the radius. And its main action is to assist the biceps brachii to forcibly supinate the forearm. It works alone in slow supination also, and it's an antagonist of the pronator muscles. It's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. Next, we have the abductor pollicis longus, and this is lateral and parallel to the extensor pollicis longus, and is just distal to the supinator. Its origin is the posterior surface of the radius and ulna, and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is the base of the first metacarpal and the trapezium, and its action is to abduct and extend the thumb, and it's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. The extensor pollicis brevis and the extensor pollicis longus is overlain by the extensor carpi ulnaris. Its origin is the dorsal shaft of the radius and ulna and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is the base of the proximal and distal phalanx of the thumb. Its prime action is to extend the thumb and is innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. Finally, we have the extensor indices right over here. And this is a tiny muscle that's arising close to the wrist. Its origin is the posterior surface of the distal ulna and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is the extensor expansion of the index finger, and it joins the tendon of the extensor digitorum. Its prime action is to extend the index finger, and it assists in wrist extension. And it's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. So be sure to view the animation. This one shows the posterior lateral view of the supinator. This one goes over the muscles of the forearm. Another one that goes over the muscles of the forearm. And finally, you have one more that goes over the muscles of the forearm. So be sure you view uh, all these uh, animations. Uh, either go to the, the website for Pearson or uh, the, the disc that may have come uh, with your book. In addition to that, you should be able to find it on YouTube. So in this illustration, what they're showing you is that uh, for the posterior compartment of the arm, uh, the muscles that extend the elbows is innervated by the radial nerve. And the muscles uh, that do the extending are the triceps brachii. And then for the muscles that are flexing, your flexors in the anterior compartment of your arm, uh, it's innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. And you have your uh, short head and the long head of the biceps brachii and the brachialis muscle. And here's your humerus over here. Uh, and over here you can see the blood vessels. You have a vein, uh, an artery, another vein, and an artery. And in this uh, illustration here, they're showing you the forearm, so the posterior compartment of the forearm, and it, uh, it's responsible for extending the wrists and fingers, 
and it's innervated by the radial nerve. So you can see the extensors over here, and then over here, this is showing you uh, the anterior compartment of the forearm, and these are the, the flexors that you're going to find here. So this flexes the wrist and the fingers, and it's innervated by the median uh, or the ulnar nerve. Uh, so when you look at the uh, these muscles over here, we have the uh, brachioradialis, the pronator teres, and the abductor pollicis longus. And we have more animations here. So this one's going over the muscles that act on the wrists and fingers. And another one that goes over the carpal tunnel. And finally, there's another one that goes over the rotating hand. So again, please head over to the Pearson website, or you can search for it on YouTube, or go refer to the, the, the disc that may have come with your book. Now we're going to be looking at the intrinsic muscles of the hand, which are responsible for the fine movements of the fingers. All of these small muscles lie entirely in the palm and none on the hand's dorsal side. These small weak muscles mostly control precise movements leaving the powerful movements of the fingers to the forearm muscles. The intrinsic muscles include the main abductors and adductors of the fingers, as well as muscles that produce the movement of opposition, which is moving the thumb towards the little finger. In addition to that, it allows for movements that enables you to grip objects in the palm, so as in when you're holding a baseball bat. Thumb movements are defined differently from the movements of the other fingers because the thumb lies at a right angle to the rest of the hand. The thumb flexes by bending medially along the palm, not by bending anteriorly as the other fingers do. And the thumb extends by pointing laterally, not posteriorly, as the other fingers do. The intrinsic muscles of the palm are divided into three groups. Those in the thenar eminence, which is the ball of the thumb. Those that are in the hypothenar eminence, which is the ball of the little fingers. And those that are in the mid palm. The thenar and the hypothenar muscles are almost mirror images of one another. Each contain a small flexor, an abductor, and an opponent's muscle. The mid-palmar muscles, called the lumbar cals and the interossei, they extend our fingers at the interphalangeal joints. The interossei are also the main finger abductors and adductors. We're going to start off by looking at the thenar muscles in the ball of the thumb, and the first muscle that we're going to be looking at is the abductor pollicis brevis, which is right over here. And this is a lateral muscle of the thenar group. It's superficial, so when you're abducting your thumb, so when you bring your thumb towards your index finger, that muscle that you see that's bulging out the most, this is that muscle. This is that abductor pollicis brevis. Its origin is a flexor retinaculum and the nearby carpals, and its insertion is the lateral base of the thumb's proximal phalanx. Its main action is to abduct the thumbs at the carpal metacarpal joint, and it's innervated by the median nerve. Next, we have the flexor pollicis brevis, and this is the medial and deep muscle of the thenar group. Its origin is the flexor retinaculum and the nearby carpals, and the insertion is the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Its prime action is that it flexes the thumb at the carpal metacarpal and the metacarpal phalangeal joints, and it's innervated by the median and occasionally the ulnar nerve. Next, we have the adductor pollicis. This is a fan-shaped muscle with horizontal fibers. It's distal to the other thenar muscles, and it has oblique and transverse heads. Its origin is a capitate bone and the bones of metacarpals 2, 3, and 4, in addition to the front of metacarpal 3. And its insertion is the medial side of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. As for its action, it adducts and helps to pose the thumb and it's innervated by the ulnar nerve. The opponent's pollicis is deep to the abductor pollicis brevis on metacarpal 1. Its origin is the flexor retinaculum and the trapezium, and its insertion is the whole anterior side of metacarpal 1. Its prime movement is opposition, so this is the muscle that allows you to move your thumb and touch the tip of your little finger. It's innervated by the median, or occasionally the ulnar nerve. Now we're going to be looking at the hypothenar muscles in the ball of the little finger. And the first one that we're going to be looking at is the abductor digiti minimi. And this is the medial muscle of the hypothenar group and it's superficial. Its origin is a pisiform bone and its insertion is the medial side of the proximal phalanx of the little finger. And its main action is to abduct the little fingers at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And it's innervated by the ulnar nerve. The flexor digiti minimum brevis, it's a lateral deep muscle of the hypothenar group. Its origin is the hamate bone and the flexor retinaculum. Its insertion is the same as the abductor digiti minimi. And its action is to flex the little fingers at the metacarpal phalangeal joint, and it's also innervated by the ulnar nerve. The opponent's digiti minimi is deep to the abductor digiti minimi. Its origin is the same as the flexor digiti minimi brevis, and its insertion is most of the length of the medial side of the metacarpal 5. 
Its action is that it helps in opposition. It brings metacarpal 5 towards the thumb to cup the hand. And it's also innervated by the ulnar nerve. Now we're going to be moving on to the mid palmar muscles and the first muscle we're going to be looking at is the lumbricals. We have four of these worm shaped muscles in our palm, one to each finger with the exception of the thumb, usually because they originate from the tendons of another muscle. So here you can see the first lumbricalis, this is the second lumbricalis, and this is the third lumbrical, and this is the fourth lumbrical. And as you can see, uh, the origin is the lateral side of each tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus in the palm. Its insertion is the lateral edge of the extensor expansion on the proximal phalanx of fingers 2, 3, 4, and 5. And its action is to flex the fingers at the metacarpal phalangeal joints, but it also extends the fingers at the intraphalangeal joints. It's innervated by the lateral 2 median nerves and the median 2 ulnar nerves. The palmar interosteae are four long cone-shaped muscles in the spaces between the metacarpals. They lie ventral to the dorsal interosteae. Its origin is on the side of each metacarpal that faces the mid-axis of the hand, but it's absent from metacarpal 3. Its insertion is the extensor expansion on the first phalanx of each finger, except for finger 3, and on the side facing the mid-axis of the hand. As for the action, these are the adductors of the fingers. It pulls the fingers in towards the third digit. It also acts with the lumbricals to extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints and flexes them at the metacarpal phalangeal joints. For its nerve supply, it's innervated by the ulnar nerve. The dorsal interosteae are four bipennate muscles that are filling the spaces between the metacarpals. These are the deepest palm muscles that are also visible on the dorsal side of the hand. Its origin is the size of the metacarpals and the insertion are the extensor expansions over the proximal phalanx of fingers 2, 3, and 4 on the sides opposite the mid-axis of the hands, but on both sides of finger 3. And you can see that over here. So here's the proximal phalanx, and it's on the opposite side of the mid-axis. This is the mid-axis, so this is the opposite side of the mid-axis, with the exception of, so you can see it over here, this is the side opposite of the mid-axis, the side opposite of the mid-axis, with the exception of the third digit, with your middle finger. It's on both sides. And its prime action is to abduct the fingers or diverge the fingers. In addition to that, it also extends the fingers at the intraphalangeal joints and it flexes them at the metacarpal phalangeal joints. For its nervous supply, it's innervated by the ulnar nerve. And that's it for this lecture. So be sure to see the previous lectures if you haven't seen those already. Uh, in addition to that, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or send me a message through YouTube or you can send me a message on Facebook. Uh, my contact information is in the description below. If you like the videos, please give it a big thumbs up and please also be sure to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And also please share with your friends, your classmates, and anybody else that you think may find it useful. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.